It's September 15, 1944. A pivotal moment in the Pacific theater of World War II unfolds on the remote island of Palaliu. As dawn breaks over the horizon, an eerie silence blankets the scene. For three days prior, the relentless bombardment from ship guns and the thunderous descent of bombs from the skies had transformed the tranquil landscape into a realm of chaos and desolation. Amidst this haunting serenity, a new symphony begins to play, emerging from the shimmering waters. A procession of amphibious vehicles advances resolutely toward the shore. Inside them, the U.S. Marines of the 1st Marine Division ready themselves for the ordeal ahead, known as the Old Breed. These are the veterans of Guadalcanal, battle-hardened men who have stared into the eyes of combat and emerged as heroes. But Peleliu is not Guadalcanal. The enemy awaiting them on this unforgiving island is a different adversary altogether. Unbeknownst to many Marines, the Battle of Peleliu will be their last. No more than four days. The island spanning a mere five square miles held significant strategic value in the southwestern Pacific region, specifically as part of the endeavor to reclaim the Philippines. Securing the Japanese-held Palau Islands was crucial for the Pacific Ocean Area Command. Not only did these islands pose a threat by standing as a potential menace in the rear of the Philippines, but they also offered a protective shield for the American left flank once liberated. Of particular importance within this mission was the island of Palaliu. How important it was in American plans says the fact that General Douglas MacArthur, the supreme commander of the Southwest Pacific area, sent one of the best and most experienced units the Navy had at its disposal. The 1st Marine Division to capture the island. His plan, codenamed Operation Stalemate II, was to subject the island and its defenders to massive artillery fire and aerial bombardment before disembarking the troops. Three regiments of the 1st Marine Division, the 1st, 5th, and 7th, would land on the southwest beach in the vicinity of the island's airfield. The landing zone was divided into three operational zones. The 1st Marines were planned to land in the north sector on White Beach 1 and White Beach 2. South of them were the 5th Marines on Orange Beach 1 and Orange Beach 2, and on the southernmost sector, the 7th Marines on Orange Beach 3. The total number of men engaged in the assault was 25,000, with the 5th Marines in the center, the 1st on the left, and the 7th on the right flank. The task force was planned to secure the beach to allow the rest of the units to land, including the 11th Marine Regiment artillery. After breaking the Japanese defensive perimeter, the Marines were supposed to overrun the rest of the enemy with numerical and technical superiority. Commander of the 1st Marine Division, Major General William H. Rupertus, was confident his unit would take no more than four days to seize the island. It never crossed his or anyone else's mind that this tiny island would be the scene of one of the war's bloodiest battles. Honeycomb System What the American commanders didn't know was that the Japanese had learned from their previous mistakes and redefined their island defense strategy, abandoning the conventional practice of opposing landings directly on exposed beaches they forged a novel approach to establish a multi-layered defense strategy extending deeper into the island's core. Accordingly, the Japanese also abandoned the conventional Banzai charge in favor of entangling the American forces in a war of attrition. At the time of the battle, the island of Peleliu hosted an approximately 11,000 strong Japanese 14th Infantry Division. The commander of its 2nd Regiment, Colonel Kunio Nakagawa, was tasked with organizing the defense. Nakagawa brilliantly exploited Palaliu's challenging terrain, crafting an intricate labyrinth of fortified bunkers, interconnected caves, and underground redoubts, applying the so-called honeycomb system. The key point in Nakagawa's system was the Umur Brogol Mountain, a towering expanse encompassing a cluster of hills and steep ridges that dominated the island landscape. This natural citadel was transformed into a bastion, with over 500 interconnected limestone caves linked by a web of tunnels and entrances, ingeniously adapted to withstand grenade and flamethrower assaults. The mountain's exterior was covered with sliding armored steel doors accommodating an array of weaponry, including 47mm and 20mm guns, 81mm and 150mm mortars, and 20mm anti-aircraft cannons. To further impede the anticipated American assault, 
The beaches were artfully laden with obstacles. Concealed mines and artillery shells strategically poised to detonate upon contact. A battalion was positioned along the shore to withhold the advance of the American forces. The new Japanese tactic would devastate the Americans, whose hopes of swiftly ending the battle with minimal casualties would have been crushed already on the first day of the battle. The Point the invasion force arrived at the Palau Archipelago on September 11, 1944. The first units to approach the island were underwater demolition teams 6 and 7, with the task of clearing the landing zone from obstacles. After their job was completed, on the morning of September 12, the fleet comprising five battleships, four heavy cruisers and three light cruisers opened fire on the island. During three days of heavy bombardment, they fired 2,364 rounds on Japanese positions. In pauses between salvos, planes from three aircraft carriers, five light aircraft carriers, and 11 escort carriers dropped 1,793,500 pounds of bombs. Even though the Americans believed their bombardment campaign was successful, in reality, it achieved no results. Except for Japanese aircraft and installations on the airfield, no Japanese positions were harmed. Not even the battalion deployed to defend the beach. The Japanese hid in their fortified positions and simply waited for the bombardment to end. When the day of the assault arrived, they were ready to give the Marines a hellish welcome. At 0800 hours on September 15th, 1944, protected by a barrage of high explosive fire, and the screen of white phosphorus smoke shells. Assault waves of the Marines packed in LVTs and DUKWs advanced toward the shore, maneuvering through a shower of Japanese artillery and mortar fire. They reached the beach around 0830 hours. The 1st Marines launched their assault on the white beaches. While the 2nd Battalion pushed inland, the 3rd Battalion faced staunch resistance from a rugged coral ridge nicknamed The Point. Posing an unexpected obstacle, the Japanese resistance at the point faltered the initial assault, even though it was supported by tanks that arrived on the beach in the fourth landing wave. Amidst this critical situation, reinforcements were summoned to defend the sector against counterattacks that could endanger the beachhead's left flank. Company K attacked a heavily fortified Japanese position at the point in fierce combat lasting more than two hours. The key target was a concrete casemate housing a 47mm gun that was causing havoc among the Marines. The casemate was destroyed only after a group of soldiers crept on it from above. A shot from a rifle grenade ignited the rounds inside the pillbox and destroyed it. In the end, Company K seized the point, but at the cost of heavy casualties. Furthermore, they had to defend the position for the next 30 hours, fighting off four Japanese counterattacks. Captain George P. Hunt, commanding the company, defended the point at one moment with only 18 men and a captured Japanese machine gun. The airfield. In the center, the 5th Marines encountered mixed challenges and successes. Anti-beach defenses were less intense than those in the northern sector, with sporadic resistance on the shores. The 1st Battalion advanced with minimal obstacles while the 3rd Battalion faced a delay due to the loss of its commanding officer, which resulted in the uncoordinated advance of the battalion companies. Nevertheless, by the afternoon, the regiment made a push all the way to the airfield, where they formed a defensive perimeter just in time to fight off the Japanese counterattack. On the right flank, the 7th Marines encountered obstacles on Beach Orange 3, facing resistance and mined shores. Despite initial setbacks, the Marines repelled night counterattacks and adjusted their tactical approach by dawn. By the end of the day, the Marines had secured the beachhead, allowing the rest of the 1st Marine Division to land on the island. The 01 phase line was reached in the central and southern sectors. However, on the White Beach, the 1st Marines were far from making any significant success. On the second day of the assault, the 5th Marines went on with capturing the airfield and pushing towards the eastern shore, a mission pivotal for the campaign. Amidst Japanese artillery fire from the Umurbrogol mountain, the 5th Marines remained resolute in their advance. The 1st Battalion made notable progress by securing the northern section of the airfield, engaging in intense combat to dislodge entrenched enemies from anti-tank trenches and revetments. 
The airfield capture allowed the American planes to use it starting September 17th for much-needed aerial spotting and dive-bombing missions. Meanwhile, the 2nd Battalion encountered different obstacles, battling through dense woods and jungle against well-entrenched foes in elevated positions. The 2nd Battalion's efforts culminated in capturing the Nagardololoc area, which expanded the territorial control across the northeastern peninsula and isolated the remaining Japanese resistance in the eastern part of the island. Following the airfield capture, the 5th Marines were engaged in mopping up operations, eliminating enemy pockets, and fortifying captured areas against counterattacks. By the end of the month, they completed their final objective, the capture of small Nasebus Island to the north of Palaliu. Inch by inch. The situation for the 1st Marines, however, was far from ideal. After securing the point, they advanced toward the Umar Bragol pocket, or the Bloody Nose Ridge of Palaliu, as the Marines called it, due to its treacherous terrain and fortified enemy positions. Advancing into the mountain, the 1st Marines found themselves trapped in the deadly crossfire. The Japanese, known for their disciplined and calculated fire, exacted heavy casualties on the Marines, especially as they moved through the narrow pathways amidst the ridges. Particularly intense was the clash for Hill 100. Captain Everett P. Pope spearheaded a daring advance into the ridges, guiding his 90 remaining men to capture what he believed to be Hill 100. After a day of fierce combat, they reached what he thought was the hill's peak, but it turned out to be another ridge occupied by more entrenched Japanese defenders. Trapped at the ridge's base, Pope established a modest defensive perimeter, relentlessly assaulted by the Japanese throughout the night. Depleted of ammunition, the Marines resorted to hand-to-hand -hand combat, wielding knives and fists, and even hurling coral rocks and empty ammunition boxes at their adversaries. Pope and his troops tenaciously held their ground until dawn, only to be met with a fresh onslaught of lethal enemy fire. Upon evacuation, a mere nine survivors remained. Pope's remarkable bravery in this battle earned him the Medal of Honor, a testament to his unwavering leadership and resilience. As days passed, the regiment faced challenging terrain and a tenacious enemy that skillfully defended their positions. Eventually, the 1st Marine's high casualty rate led to the arrival of the 7th Marines as support. However, the entry of the relatively fresh troops unaltered the nature of the battle, resulting in substantial casualties on both sides. The Marines persisted in their assaults, aiming to secure crucial points like Walt Ridge and the Five Sisters. Even though their endeavors encountered unyielding resistance, machine gun fire, and demanding terrain. By September 22nd, a sense of futility had taken hold. The Marines were pressing, but were constantly entangled in a treacherous terrain funnel, nestled between steep coral formations and heavily fortified enemy positions. The intense conflict on Palaliu inflicted immense losses on both sides, with the Japanese estimating over 5,000 casualties. Despite the courageous endeavors of the 1st and 7th Marines, the battle was taking its toll on them. Clearly, reinforcements were necessary. The most suitable unit with the required strength was the Army's 321st Regimental Combat Team, a part of the 81st Infantry Division, the Wildcats, which had concluded its operations on the nearby island of Angar by September 20th. Despite General Rupertus's reluctance to deploy Army troops, the 321st Infantry landed on the island's western coast on September 23rd and moved up the shore to relieve the exhausted 1st Marines. The fighting on Palaliu continued with the Marines, and the Army men engaged in intense close combat, often resorting to grenades, flamethrowers, and other close-quarter tactics to root out the enemy from their positions. They were paying a hefty price for every inch of the mountain. By mid-October, the 7th Marines had lost almost half of its men and had to be replaced by the 5th Marines. On the other hand, Inch by inch, the Japanese were losing their ground. As November arrived, the battle entered its final stages. The American forces managed to gain more control over the island, capturing key points and gradually reducing the Japanese defensive positions. By this point, many Japanese defenders were isolated, cut off from their supply lines and increasingly demoralized. Finally, on November 24th, Colonel Nakagawa gathered his men and proclaimed, our sword is broken, and we have run out of spears. Faced with impending defeat, 
Nakagawa, accompanied by his advisor, Major General K. Murai, enacted a solemn act. Within his command post nestled in a sizable cave within the Umur Brogol Mountains, Nakagawa ignited his regimental colors and performed seppuku, a ceremonial form of suicide. Japanese resistance officially ended there on November 25, 1944, with a coded message sent to the Japanese military headquarters at Koror, Sakura, Sakura, Cherry, Cherry, meaning, it has ended here. At what cost? The Battle of Palaliu, renowned as the most formidable struggle faced by the U.S. military during World War II, proved a harrowing endeavor. The 1st Marine Division endured severe losses, rendering them incapacitated until the Okinawa invasion in April 1945. A staggering 6,500 casualties befell the division during their month-long campaign, an extraordinary toll of over a third of their strength. The 81st Infantry Division shared the burden, suffering heavy losses of 3,300 during their deployment on the island. Strikingly, American forces expended vast resources to neutralize the Japanese defenders. Reports indicate it took over 1,500 rounds of ammunition to eliminate each enemy soldier. The numbers ignited controversy within the U.S., stressing Palaliu's lack of strategic significance compared to the high cost of American lives. The captured airfield on the island held minimal relevance for subsequent operations. However, it was paid with the extensive casualties that surpassed all other amphibious Pacific War operations. It was probably for that reason that the battle received limited coverage in the U.S. press, as it remained overshadowed by MacArthur's Philippines' return and the European push towards Germany. In the annals of World War II, the Battle of Palaliu stands as a testament to courage and sacrifice. Amidst the serene island backdrop, Marines confronted an adversary more formidable than imagined. This clash redefined island warfare, exposing the perils of fortified defenses. More importantly, it introduced the Americans to the horrors awaiting them on their warpath to Japan. Thank you for watching this episode. Please like and subscribe to the Militology channel if you want to see more content. Stay on the front lines with us by hitting the bell icon to be notified on our newest videos.